be back. Welcome, everyone. Why don't we get started? <laughs> Looks like we have a call. As they say. A couple more coming in. Are there? Yeah. Oh, yeah, just as the rain strikes. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. All right. You're not the speaker today. Well, thanks again, Rabbi Bruce Elder, for joining us again. It seemed like to me just uh, really recently that we had uh, a really great conversation with the most recent times that we were here. And it's I hope always fun. Well, if everybody remembers a little bit of it, it sounds like we're going to kind of pick up. Um, on the theme, yeah, yeah so to a certain extent. So let me know if we if it went to put these slides on. I thought we'd uh, get started and make the most of most of our time. So that's good. Would you all be with me in spirit of prayer? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, we give you thanks for all the opportunities we have to learn uh, in this world, to learn about your creation, and to try to come closer to your wisdom for us. We give you thanks for the speakers who are willing to give us their time and their expertise and help us understand uh, their world and our world. And we ask that you uh, open our minds and open our hearts this morning and let us um, absorb everything you have for us today. Amen. Amen. And because I think it's it's a while since we've done something like this, guys, just to as a, a nice reminder, I've forgotten some of this myself about who we are and what we'd like, if anybody asks, uh, around you know the church, the community. What's spiritual enrichment? WCC's Ministry of Faith Exploration and Formation, uniting head and heart in pursuit of an honest and vibrant Christian faith that is open, relevant, faithful, and transformative. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> and if you would, as we have in the past, please read this with me together, our mission, which is Enriching lives, extending day, transforming hearts. Then to get a little more deeply about our values. Could you read with me? We believe that the spirit of charity is a lifelong process. Through our life years, we continue to explore deep questions, examine ethical challenges, wisdom, faith, and compassion for others. We grow up by trying to understand our vision, the wisdom of the ages, the other spark of our spirit, and being recognized and heard in valuable conversations with others, independently and welcome. I hope that a uh, nice reminder for everybody and a little bit of inspiration. Thank you again, please. We're here to learn. All right, it's good to see everybody again. Let me um, first apologize for my dress. I normally <laughs> do not come in jeans and uh, a shirt like this. Uh, Friday morning, I woke up with a real taste for Haitian food from Springfield, Ohio. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm getting in my car and driving to Springfield, Ohio after this for a late lunch, early dinner. There is a five o'clock worship service in support of the Haitian community. Uh, followed by, uh, there's a few restaurants that hopefully I'm going to get in for some, like I said, late lunch, early dinner, and breakfast tomorrow. So I needed to be in drive-worthy clothing. So <laughs> I figured if I explained it to you, that you would understand. So I appreciate that. Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> I actually just made that up. I wanted to applause. Um, it's being run um, by the, the service tonight at five o'clock, they're an hour ahead of us. It was being put on by Reverend William Barber of oh, uh, the Poor People's Cam Campaign. And I mention that because I want to start today by something that happened the last time I interacted with the uh, Poor People's Campaign. Poor People's Campaign is a national movement to for people who are poor to be able to reassert their rights um, and their uh, uh, to being treated fairly, to having an opportunity in America. And in about 2017, I think it was, 2016, 2018, it all brings it together pre-COVID, um, there was a march put on by the Chicago chapter, some of you might remember this, where they walked from downtown to Springfield to protest and to demand certain rights. So I walked with them the first day from downtown almost to Midway. I pulled off in the middle at one point. But I was at a rally uh, right beforehand downtown in the Loop. 
Federal Plaza, I think it was. No, it wasn't. It was somewhere on there. And there were all kinds of groups warming up uh, with music and poetry. And the last person to warm up uh, at the crowd before the rally began was uh, an African-American artist, musical artist, who um, spent time in prison. And he's well known, I guess, in the black community on the South Side. So he gets up there and he's about to start his, his song. And he says, I want to just explain this song to you. I call this song, Expletive the Police, F the Police. But I want you to know that when I wrote it and when I'm singing it, I'm not singing it so much about Chicago's police, which abuse me. I'm singing it about Israel. So I turned to my colleague friend who was to the right and I said, did I just hear that right? We are sitting here in a rally for people who are poor in the United States. And somebody gets up and says that and the crowd goes crazy. <laughs> As if that belonged there. Now that wasn't the first time I've experienced something like that on the left as one who hangs out in those circles. <laughs> but it was number two in a number of incidents, instances that have happened that made me realize that we Jews who call ourselves Zionists, regardless of what our views are, are in real trouble. Because by that time, I realized that if I was ever to call upon to speak at rallies, and I forgot what I had to say, if I stood up and said something about Boo Israel, I'd be the most popular person there, regardless of the topic. Back in February, um, there was in Chicago a campaign, a housing campaign called uh, Bring Chicago Home, Bring Home Chicago, Bring... Uh, it was on the ballot to uh, legislate affordable housing in the city. It was a big push. Some synagogues signed on. The head of the coalition that was pushing it called somebody with whom I'm friendly in a Jewish justice organization to ask if any of those synagogues were Zionists. Because if they were Zionists, they wanted them off the support. <clears throat> we at Hakafa have been supporting trans families that have had to escape their state because of horrible legislation, and we're helping move them here. You and I talked about that. I know someone who works at a local seminary, not Gary at Evanston, I don't want you to think of another one, who wanted to know if they could help out their social justice group. I explained to them we would love to have their help, but you had to have a conversation I said to this person with your group because we are a Zionist congregation and your people need to know that. Never heard from her again. <laughs> and finally, my wife and I were in uh, Maine this summer. How many of you went to Maine this summer? Because it seems like everybody went to Maine this summer. <laughs> no, <'cause>, or Italy. <laughs> or Italy. Everyone was in, I don't know why it was, right? So I'm surprised I didn't see anyone I knew. Uh, I had congregants who ran into other congregants. So um, we were in Rockland, Maine. It happened to be uh, Maine Lobster Festival, which, okay, I wasn't there for that. <laughs> I tasted a little bit, but I, I haven't had any in a long time because I don't do lobster. But um, have any of you been to Rockland, Maine? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a really pretty progressive place. Oh, yeah. when, it, when, you, when you are walking down the streets, almost every store has a pride flag in it. Great, it should. And next to it, every, every just about every store has a, every shop, not everyone, because there's a few that aren't, but for very strong reason. But if you say, everybody is welcome here, which is fantastic. Until you walk into the store. That's not. It's the only way you can do it. It's the new phones, Jim. Sorry, Chuck, can you mute yourself? Hi, Chuck. You're on the airplane. Oh, you're on the airplane. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks you. for joining us, Chuck. It's good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> so until you walk into these stores, and you see that all the literature, if they have a book up around anything, 
who are all about the Palestinian narrative that were incredibly anti-Israel, and there was nothing else there. And I'm walking down the street in Rockland, Maine, and I'm thinking, it says everybody's welcome here, but me. At the Maine Lobster Festival that night, as we were walking, that we were walking down the streets, there was a um, at the has anyone been to the lobster festival? Yeah, don't. So uh, it was there was a booth. There was a booth that was being run by the three percenters. Y'all know who the three percenters are? The three percenters are the same as the Proud Boys, but to the right of them. They had a huge. This was a huge display there. And there was a huge, even right of Trump population there, promoting gun rights, promoting all this stuff. This was on the, on the, on the This was on the walkway oh. as as a booth, as part of the fair, as part of Lobster Festival. Wow. wow. So here I am with my wife, thinking, I can't be here. I can't be there. Where are we? And this is kind of the place where I want to start this conversation, which was supposed to be the conversation we had in March. <clears throat> Back when I was with you in March, I was invited to come speak about what was happening on college campuses. And I was asked to come as somebody who considers himself a Zionist, who is very openly and willingly critical of Israel, not just this government, but everything leading up to this, I don't need it yet, everything leading up to this government. But when I got here in March, I realized that I wanted to have some definitions for us to discuss so that we can all kind of be, you can see where I was at. So I talked about occupation, I talked about genocide, I talked about colonialism, a few of the terms, and I promised to come back and continue the terms. I'm going to semi-break my promise. Because I think everything that's gone on since then, I can still answer that. But I felt it was really important to come back, especially since I, I quickly previewed the conversation you had last week. I wanted to pull us back from there and talk about here. So I want to kind of talk to you about what it is to be a, what I will call a Zionist, what other people will call me, a progressive Zionist, liberal Zionist, anti-Semite, whatever you want to call it. I want to talk to you about how those of us in the middle are feeling and kind of how I view what's going on in college campuses began, which is not just college campuses, but really a microcosm of what's going on in the entire left, vis the Jewish community in America. Okay, please. <laughs> okay. So to do that, I want to start with a question. Those of you who are older than me, I'm not going to... Those of you who are my age or older, those of you who graduated college before 1989, <laughs> I'm going to have asked this question at the end last time. Is it, uh, but how many of you took a class on the Middle East when you were in college? No one? Okay. How many of you learned about the history of the Middle East at any time growing up? You can raise your hand. Not growing up, but seminary. In seminary, you did. Did you? Okay. Did you graduate college before 1989? No, but I'm so glad that you thought I might have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm just because I asked the question. Yeah, okay. I know. Were you <laughs> take, So I, I, I majored in. Um, in history and psychology and Jewish studies stuff at Indiana University, four and for the first time. I mean, long time. Fight, fight, fight. No, we had that thing. Go, are you? Fight, fight, fight. I don't tell a lot of people. So, I, <laughs> so when I took every Middle East course I took, and I even took a course in the history of, of Afghanistan and Iran, every Middle East course up till about 1989, we're talking about Judaism, we're talking about Israel made no mention whatsoever about the Palestinian narrative. I guarantee you, if you were to learn anything about the Middle East, up until like 1989, 1990, if anything was mentioned about the Palestinians, it was this much, and it was through the lens of a Western view. And if you watched television or the movies, who were the villains? 
Of course, people who are black, Arabs, Russians for a while, Arabs, right? And what we saw on the news about Palestinians was Munich in 1972. Uh, the uh, what was the name of the boat? Uh, oh right, the Lori uh, Andrea Doria. What was it? The Andrea Doria, like, yeah, the one in which the uh, in the Palestinians took it over, and the there was an Israeli who used to, who was in a wheelchair, who used a wheelchair, who was pushed over the oh, side yeah. and killed. Right. Everything you saw about the Palestinians was negative. We grew up on a healthy dose of really good one-sided historical reality. <laughs> and at the same time, of all the people in the Middle East, save for Iranians up until 1980, the Palestinian people were the most secular, were the most educated, and the most um, Western out of any of the Arab nations. So Palestinians, who were living a very difficult life, particularly in the West Bank and in Gaza since 1967, wanted to educate their children and wanted to, to get them out of the fray of what was going on over there. They started sending their kids to American universities. And those kids would go to college and they want to learn about the Middle East or see how, you know, I'm simplifying this, but I'm not. And they try to look up the history of Israel, Palestine, and all they would see is the history of Israel. They'd want to hear about what's going on in the Middle East and they'd hear a very one sided perspective on there that was not very nice about them. So, starting in, I think, 1993, a group of students, Palestinian students in Berkeley, formed a group called Students for Justice in Palestine. And their goal became to organize around Palestinian voices to begin to change the narrative on college campuses about what was going on in the Middle East. It started as a very small group that today has mushroomed to over 200 to 300 chapters across the United States and Canada, and has been the singular most effective organizing tool probably in America in bringing together a people to have their narrative heard. So much so, I read in the paper yesterday, if you read the New York Times uh, about, um, there was the article of, from the person who uh, studies um, protest movements. And she was writing about the DNC. You know that the rallies, the DNC and the DNC, there were protests around Palestine, Israel, correct? Right? right? And the West Loop all over that were distanced enough to see her. That no one really saw them or heard them. Do you know how many Black Lives Matters marches took place at the DNC? Yeah, exactly. Is it reported? No, <laughs> it's because there weren't any. Okay. Or if they were, they were so small. This issue has become so prominent on the left that it has eclipsed the number one cancer of American society, which is racism against people who are black. And the black community has jumped on board, even as there's starting to be a little tension on the left, particularly around Kamala Harris as the nominee, as to whether or not the left should vote for her or not, or they should vote for Jill Stein. In an interesting twist, Jill Stein, who's Jewish from Highland Park, the Green Party candidate, is starting to garner a lot of support from the Muslim community at the expense of a brown or black woman who's running for president, who's supporting their agenda. It's, it's kind of a sugar nut. <laughs> That's a nice way of putting it. My turn, right? That's what you're going So, Students for Justice in Palestine started organizing in 1993, and through their slow and steady progress, locally funded and frankly also funded from their parents and probably organizationally from Palestine, <clears throat> slowly began to build their base. 
as I said, very simply saying, hey, we're here too. Now, why did they catch on, particularly in the past 10 years, beyond just um, Palestinians? I want to talk about Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter began in 2013, following uh, the uh, shooting of the acquittal of George Zimmerman down in Florida after he had shot, remember he shot Trayvon Martin and was acquitted. Um, it became nationally recognized um, a year later in 2014 with what was going on in Ferguson with the shooting of Michael Brown, 2014. So the, the black community, if I can generalize about the black community as a white male, I hesitate to do that. But for the purposes of this conversation, I need to talk in generalizations. Martin Luther King Jr was very supportive of the palace of the Israel narrative. Understood Israel in the context of the country, in the post-Holocaust, in the context of which it was finding itself. Um, he was not, the black community was not universally behind that. There was a very strong black power support of Palestinian people from the beginning, who were seeing what was going on over in Israel through a black-white lens. I talked a little bit about that in March, how that is not true, that, that, that uh, perception is not accurate, um, but it persists. So there has been, mar there had been marginal black support in America for the Palestinian movement that went way back to the early 1970s. <laughs> when Michael Brown was murdered by the police and the riots broke out in 2014 in the marches, I went down to march with the folks one day. Under the assumption that we were told that we were invited to come down by the people who were protesting so that we as clergy could be on the front line, not to walk in front of the people who were protesting, but to be there as a shield when the police came after them because in the front rows, people were coming after them and beating them. When we got there, we found out that, in fact, we weren't invited by the black community who was on the street, um, that they didn't want the clergy, because the black community of the, in, the 20s, in their 20s and early 30s, which I have heard of many rallies around the country, were saying, you all got to get out of our way and let us do what we need to do. And I subscribe to that. I actually do subscribe to that. Another conversation, it might be back for that one. <laughs> But, but in the midst of what was going on in Ferguson, Palestinians from Gaza started tweeting out to Black Lives Matter three particular tweets that changed the whole complex of the relationship between Black Lives Matter and Students for Justice in Palestine. <clears throat> it just took three tweets. That is the power of social media. And these were, these were the, the three tweets on... August 13, uh, 2014, at 10.06 p.m., solidarity with At Ferguson. Remember to not touch your face when tear gas or put water on it. Instead, use milk or Coke. At 10.24, dear At Ferguson, or hashtag Ferguson, the tear gas used against you is probably tested on us first by Israel. No worries, stay strong. And number three, at 2.26 in the morning the next day, so four hours later, the oppressed stands with the oppressed at, or, uh, hashtag Palestine stands with Ferguson. Right there. That's what did it. After that, black groups on campuses started merging with um, Students for Justice in Palestine. And the movement took hold because in this world of what I understand to be um, misunderstood intersectionality, where all oppression is tied to each other, it is. I, I for one, will admit that white males are the cause of most of the problems of the world. I also admit that's only because we have been in power and if someone else were in power, they would have been the problems of the world. Okay, so thank you, white males, for fulfilling that for everybody. Uh, so that even though we there are links, 
that to try to solve all of them denies each of the oppressions their uniqueness, which prevents any of them from being addressed meaningfully. Mm -hmm. I'm probably wrong about that. <laughs> we might not, I'm, I'm with friends, so thank you. Uh, I, I'm probably wrong about that, but I'm sticking with it. So you've got what developed in the mid 2010s, 10 years ago, a very strong movement. And by now, Students for Justice in Palestine had been working for 20 years and slowly <laughs> building voices that were listening to them. And so college kids who were hearing this for the first time in 1993 now were adults and becoming professors and coming back and, and focusing on what they heard. So what I'm getting at in a sense is that what happened until 1989 in which all we heard about was the Jewish-Israeli westernized perspective on Israel-Palestine by 2024, the next 30, 40 years swung completely the other way. So that now on campuses, people have been fully, and I say this without um, judgment, anger but not judgment, indoctrinated to a Palestinian narrative, Palestinian story that denies largely the Israel narrative, the Western narrative, which feeds into this sense of white male power and intersectionality. So when you go on college campuses right now, the majority, camp, uh, classes around Israel are, are that have Jewish or Israeli professors that aren't known to be lefties, have diminishing people coming to them or are boycotted, and ones that have a perspective from the Palestinian narrative have a very strong following. Now, before I continue on, on this, I, I want to take a step back and talk about what about us Jews in the midst of this. Can I ask a question? Yeah. There? When, when was the first Intifada? Uh, 1988. So right around the time when the, that's when the narrative started to be told. That it was. Not, not an unimportant thing to mention. Thank you. And the second one was in 2002. <clears throat> I think I got 88. Was 88 was the first one? I thought it was in the 80s. Yeah, I think it was 88. That's something that a rabbi should know. <laughs> <laughs> Call it 88 if I'm wrong. Flavor. Okay, so I want to talk about um, the Jewish community in the midst of all this. Particularly, well, I'll just, I'll, 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 I'll stop. I'll, oh, anyhow, <laughs> my colleague, mentor, dear friend, um, Rabbi Marx, Robert Marx, who was the founder of the Jewish Council on Urban Affairs, was the founder of Congregation Hakafa, uh, who, who died in 2021, and I still mourn his loss. Many of you might have known him. Uh, in the 1950s, huge giant in the justice movement, uh, was in MLK's inner circle when he was here in the 1960s, et cetera, et cetera. Um, talked about, um, wrote a paper in the 1950s called The People in Between. The Jews, talking about the Jews, and talked about the Jews being an interstitial people. And by interstitial, he meant that we Jews throughout history have never been of the power and never been of the masses, but somehow always somewhere in between and um, used by and exploited by both. And his analysis states that for forever, Though we, us bouncing between power and disempowered, that we Jews placed our lot with those in power and tried to suck up to power because of the hope was if they like us, then we will be okay. And that really hasn't done us so well throughout our history. <laughs> so that perhaps what is supposed to might be the thing to do is to put our lot with folks in an intersectional kind of way that we didn't call it that way, to see that we as a minority are in a boat, not unlike everybody else, and should invest in that, but not be surprised if, in fact, there is pushback. The most obvious example of Jews as interstitial people are um, the shops in um, Garfield Park, Humboldt Park, and in um, Douglas Park. 
Big Jewish population living on the west side of Chicago until white flight in the 1950s and 60s. People who stayed back were one or two Jewish shop owners who wanted to provide a service for the local black community because everyone was abandoning it. So they stayed in town. And when the riots broke out in the 1960s, who did they go after? They go after the Jews, the, the Jewish shop owners who are trying to exploit them. Hmm. Again, that's not a judgment, but that's what happened. So that, that's a classic example of Jews being in between. Jews disproportionately being in the civil rights movement was us, one, thinking it was the right thing to do, two, realizing that civil rights for black people are civil rights for Jewish people as well, and number three, taking our interstitial role because we had more power than black people and, and saying, let us do it for the good of everyone so that we can elevate all of our voices together. And then the presidency, then a Jew became the president of the NAACP, which we never should have done, and it all fell apart. Mm -hmm. Can you go to the slides now slides, for a moment? Mm -hmm. So we being a people in between. Share screen. Yeah, go to the share screen. Yeah. Bottom left there, the green. Mm -hmm. And then go to uh, up top, go to sh to slideshow, below the blue thing, below the black thing. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. There, there you go. go. Go to slideshow. Slideshow, yeah. And you can hit that and then go from the, hit that and then on the left from the beginning. I'm getting. Okay, that's what we're doing today. Go to the next one. <laughs> okay, these slides come from, I borrowed these from a group called Project Shema uh, that works on breaking down some of the misconceptions around Jews and why we're in this place that we are now. Their analysis, which feeds beautifully into this interstitial analysis, is that most people on the street don't know who or what Jews are. On the left, what they do basically is see the Jewish people through the eyes of religion or through skin color. Not realizing that up to 20, 25% of Jews in America are not white, <clears throat> let alone the whole world. It's about 50% of Jews around the world are not white. So what we don't see, people who don't know us, what they don't see is underneath the level, underneath that we're not just a religion of white people, but that we have language, ethnicities, all races, history, nation, and culture. We're a complex people. Turn the next slide, if you would, please. Mm -hmm. A traditional analysis of, from the left will show that, just uh, click uh, the arrow to the right there. It should work, no? Um, are we stuck? No, here we go. There we go. Uh, that if you, if you um, look to the left, you'll see that an analysis from the left is that systemic bigotries as, a, as a, on an axis of time and status that oppress people tend to be down here, though they have made gains, and people who are powerful maintain their power up here. Go to the next slide if you would, please. Mm -hmm. Jews are different. <clears throat> Jews have always, as I said before, have bounced between having power and not having power which folks on the left who are traditionally oppressed don't see, don't understand, because it's not their story. Keep going, please. Mm -hmm. Many people who are, oh, go back, go back, go back, go back. Okay. Many people who are progressive view the world through the lens of white supremacy and colonialism. You've heard all of this holding up systemic and structural power in which white people have the power and everyone else is kept below in a very simple binary lens. Since the advent of social media, since Donald Trump came down the escalator, since, Elon, since the advent of Twitter, binary ideas have only gotten simpler and stronger each way. So keep going, Greg, if you would. What that means is if you're looking at everything through a binary lens, you don't see the nuances of what Jews are, you don't understand where we are in power, you see only the color of our skin, and based on that, we're able to make dehumanizing and problematic frameworks surrounding us. Keep going if you want. 
What happens basically then is we get into the trouble that we are in vis-a-vis -vis how the left views Jews who support Israel today. <laughs> Keep going. I'm rushing through this because I want to make sure we get everything. Okay, we're off. Come off the screen if you would, please. That's for later. Oh, the map? Yeah. Okay, so stop sharing. Yeah, stop sharing. Right. If you go back up to the top, the red. Oh, thank you. Yeah. There you go. I'm great. I use that to show you. I rushed through that. I know. I, I, sh I, I put that in there to show you that what's going on today in America with a binary idea is that the simpler we try to look at everything, the worse it is for the Jews. Because, again, we are in this weird space, even today in America, in which we don't belong anywhere. Even though it seems like we belong anywhere. Since October 7th, we have definitely found out that we don't. I am not one to subscribe to the idea that anytime there's criticism of Israel, it's anti-Semitism. I am not one to subscribe to the idea that people who don't like Israel are inherently anti-Semitic. I don't even like the term anti-Semitism. I told you that last time because I think that the term anti-Semitism uh, feeds into the word was created by an anti-Semite in order to make it sound scientific. It's, yeah. it's Jew hate. We're afraid to say that because that sounds ugly, but that's what it is. I don't see it everywhere where the Jewish community is claiming it right now because the Jewish community is seeing it because it's so afraid. It's offended and it's afraid because for all of our gains that we've made in the society, we still don't believe it. So, college campuses, Students for Justice in Palestine, Black Lives Matter come together, Jews in this weird space in between. How many of you, when you went to college, uh, consider yourselves liberal? Progressive, something like that. <laughs> okay. How many? Huh? Okay. You didn't have an opinion. How many? How many? How many of you thought you knew all the answers? <laughs> okay. Those of you who were liberal or weren't doesn't really matter. How many of you went to a liberal arts college? Okay. Who goes to liberal arts colleges? Liberal. Liberal teens who want, especially the small private ones who want to go to feel good, either about feeling good about themselves or feeling bad about themselves. Some conservatives, some really rich kids. There's some of that too, but by, yeah, I don't want to deny that. Mm -hmm. Right, of course. But by and large, liberal teens, when they go to college, are looking to fight the fight. They're looking to feel good about themselves, and they're looking to punch up and to support the underdog. Understanding what is the population of the majority of liberal teens who goes to small private colleges. Wealthy, largely white, largely suburban, largely privileged. So here you've got all these liberal teens going on college campuses looking to fight the underdog. When I went, to, what year did you graduate, are you? 99. Okay, was, um, what's his name? Uh, what was his name? The preacher who used to stand outside Valentine. Was the guy still standing outside Valentine Hall? Yeah. There was this preacher who used to stand outside Valentine Hall. Anyone else go to Indiana? Or no. Uh, uh, who, would, who, would stand, who would stand out in front of, of, in the middle of campus and just start spewing anti-queer, anti-black, anti-every <laughs> anti kind of hate. But people love to get around him and just yell at him, which is what he wanted. He made his way around the Big Ten, by the way. Did he? So I went to Iowa. He was a yeah. The was same like, guy? Like, the same guy? Yeah, my, my, guess, my guess is that there was one on every campus. Yeah. <laughs> Could have been the same guy. We don't know. So people love to do that because we have to prove that we are what we think we are. So teens are still going to the campus looking for the underdog, and they come to campuses, and they see that the one issue that's being um, debated on campus more than Black Lives Matter, except in Oberlin and a few other schools, is the Palestinian narrative, what are they going to start buying into? Okay, I don't blame them. Let's talk about Jewish teens who are going to campus. <laughs> Not unlike everybody else, they want to fight the fight. I have been in Hakafa, this is my 26th year at Hakafa. We have a religious school. And in our religious school, 
when we try teaching about Israel, when we try teaching about ritual, when we try teaching about the religion in general, parents complain. That's what religious school's for, complaining. They compl right? I get it. What's the one thing that they wanted us to teach their kids? Social action, social justice. Dhaka, especially in a place like Hakafa that was founded on it, and that allows its rabbi to drive to Springfield, Ohio to get a meal. That's what we are. That's what we do. So our kids grow up in Hakafa, understanding that to be Jewish is complex. We do teach them about all this other stuff. But the message they get most of all is you have to go and work for a better society. So these kids that have been educated by largely liberal Jewish congregations, if they've been in congregations at all, who are already liberal teens going to liberal arts schools, you go to these campuses and they see that the one issue is Israel and Palestine. And that on top of that, this is their people doing this to somebody else. And they jump on board as well. So what you then have on campuses are Palestinians who've been organizing since 1993. Black Lives Matter that joined with them in the mid 2010s. Liberal teens in general wanting to fight the fight and punch upwards. Liberal Jewish teens who have been taught that when you go, you've got to fight for a just world and you see your people are being the unjust ones and they have never gotten the context because they never learned it from us, which is our failure. And by the way, the only time that they get it is by learning a rah-rah about Israel that doesn't go into the complexity of it. So if these kids go on birthright, which is the free trip to Israel that's supposed to get Jews to fall in love with Israel and with each other, and they come back, they're either enamored by the one-sidedness that really the narrative died in 1990, or they see the reality and they come back and they are so angry because they felt like they were cheated out of the reality of what was going on there, and they flip to the other side. Two Jewish organizations have developed to support, is this too much information or is this helpful? <laughs> Because I'm talking a while a minute. There's no such thing as too much. What? There's no such thing as too much. Um, <laughs> two Jewish groups yeah. developed on campus. One is called JVP, Jewish Voice for Peace. You might have heard about them. They formed in 1996 by anti-Israel Jewish activists who have been disgusted by Israel's behavior since 1967 for some since the founding of Israel. <clears throat> the former rabbi of um, Jewish Reconstructionist Congregation, if you know JRC in Evanston, is a rabbi by the name of Grant Rosen, who lived in Israel, I believe fought in the Israel army, and became incredibly disgusted about what Israel was doing and he formed, if not JVP, he formed the Rabbinic Council. JVP was a very small group of Jews, largely Noam Chomsky was one of the founders. Oh, no. Gives you a sense. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That really was seen on the fringe of, of the Jew, the panoply of Jewish organizations, who have been steadily building power on the message of to be a Jew is to is to fight for justice. And our particularism cannot supersede our universalism. Because if we view the lens of the world only through the particulars of Jewish ideas and agenda at the expense of the universal, then we become myopic and we become despotic. You can agree with that or disagree with that. Those are my words as I understand them. JVP. I have been so against JDP for a number of reasons, but I respect their right to exist and I value that they are there fighting the fight. My internal mechanism goes, but externally, when it comes down to it, I'm so glad that they're there. One of the biggest mistakes that the Jewish community has made, and we made many, is to decide that we are going to excommunicate from our community anybody who, who questions Israel. And what that did was create an entire generation of Jews since 1995, basically, that then brought up, one, 
not to have a full appreciation of Israel-Palestine, and two, to know that if they have a question about Israel, that the community is going to excommunicate them. I'm proud that Hakkafah is one of the few places that has welcomed grants and others. I'm not saying this to do this. It is very hard, even at Hakkafah, even at a place like Hakkafah, to allow space for a variety of opinions around Israel. Not kashrut, not religious practice. We don't argue about that stuff. The one thing that causes tension in our community is Israel. The other group that developed is a group they called um, If Not Now, which has only been around since 2014, that also fights for Palestinian rights and has a huge under 30 follower. Huger than it was. Huger, yeah. bigger. Okay, so you've got all these groups over here. You've got a Jewish community on the right that is, that is becoming more entrenched in its kind of right-wing agenda. And you've got the rest of us in between. I want to take a step back again and ask myself a question. If I were a young brown person looking at the country and I heard Jewish people claiming that they are a minority in need of protection, what would my response be? That's what, that, I, I, I sit with that, okay? And I look. And I see, let me get this all here. A, oh, do you know what the poverty rate in America is? One in how many people in America is poor? Do you know? One out of four? One out of six. Okay. One out of six. How many, how many African Americans, how many black people in America live in poverty? What's the rate? Half of it, 40%. One in three. About one in three. Um, uh, Latinx population. Used to be one in four with the influx of refugees and asylum seekers is probably higher than that. Okay? <clears throat> Asian Americans, one in ten. What about Jews? What is the poverty rate of Jews in America? One in five. One in six. Same as the American average. But you wouldn't know that, would you? Okay, so if I'm a young, progressive, black person, brown person on campus, and I'm looking at what I see, here's what I see. The only Jews that I see are the Jews that are supporting them, wealthy, liberal, largely white, largely privileged Jews who love to hate their privilege. I was one of those, okay? <clears throat> when they grew up, if they grew up in public schools, they probably saw a disproportionate number of Jewish teachers. Why are Jews in the helping feeling fields disproportionately? One, the non-Jews Jewish community for until 1960 or 70 largely blocked us out of most professions. Two, we like the idea of helping others to help ourselves as well, kind of like the shopkeeper as well that I mentioned before. If they went to the doctor, they probably saw a Jewish doctor. If they needed a lawyer, they probably had a Jewish lawyer. If they go to a movie, they probably see Jewish actors. All these fields, which we have filled in because we weren't allowed in the banking world and in other professions, in the business world, it was really hard for us to break into. They also see what Congress is doing. If you look at Congress, do you know how many resolutions have passed in Congress in the past four or five years that have decried anti-Semitism in America? Do you know how many? Mm -hmm. And have passed unanimously or almost unanimously? Yeah. At least three or four. There was one last year. There was one the year before. I think there was one in 2018 or 2019. Uh, the most famous one uh, came right after uh, when Elon Omar made some comment about Benjamin yeah. and the whole, you know, they wanted to, they censured her and to leave and all, right? So you, you see a Congress that has gone out of its way to um, support Jews in our country. How many congressional resolutions have passed around Islamophobia, around queer, queer community, around racism? Do you know how many resolutions? Zero. Bingo, zero. I'm a young black or brown person sitting on campus. 
All of these people that have been in my life, that's an exaggeration, but I'm saying, right? Have been Jews. The people who are supporting me are white, wealthy Jews. I see Congress defending the Jewish community largely based on anti-Semitic tropes of Jewish power and Jewish money, which frankly we have fed into because we have used our money to assert power for whatever, because we were in our interstitial role trying to cuddle up to power so that we could be okay and finding out that it's limited. So you see that happening. And if I was black or brown on campus, I would be, what are you talking about that you people think that, you're, you, that you have an intersectionality with no. us? Hmm. Or needing protection. Right? Or needing protection. Or needing protection. Right? You remember Charlottesville, right? We all know Charlottesville. When they were marching through Charlottesville, do you know what they were saying in Charlottesville? They weren't saying... Will not replace no, that's not what they were saying. The Jews will not the replace, Jews will not not replace them. The Jews will not replace us. Do you know about replacement theory? Mm -hmm. Right? So replacement theory really quickly basically says that the Jews are trying to manipulate a war between the races, uh, uh, between the black race and the white race. So the Jews facilitated the slave trade to bring all these black folk over here to give them power so that they will rise up against whites. They'll all kill each other and the Jews will take power. <laughs> Farrakhan actually bought into this. Okay, so this is Meshuganek, okay? This is crazy. <laughs> this is studio, idiocy. Absolute idiocy, okay? But when you've got these ideas out there, even if they are debunked, even if you don't believe them, and you see how Jews are asserting power in your mind, you can see why black and brown people are a little skeptical of our claims, which are real and legitimate. One second. Where was I? So here we are. October 7th breaks out. Horrible, horrible things happen. Women are brutally raped and murdered. Children are tied to their mothers and burned alive. <laughs> that literally happened. The sheer brutality of what happened is unspeakable. And on the evening of October 7th, what did Black Lives Matter Chicago tweet out? A picture of a freedom fighter parachuting into, into Israel to liberate the Palestinian people. You saw absolutely nothing but an explosion of excitement on the progressive left as to what just happened. What we saw as brutality carried out by a terrorist regime, they saw as liberators finally punching up. Not all, not everyone on the left, but that strong union, intersectional union that developed, even the Jews over there, saw this as the chance for their vision of what should be in the Middle East to finally happen. What Hamas did on October 7th was sheer evil and sheer brilliance. They managed in one fell swoop to completely deny Israel the opportunity to normalize its relationships with the majority of the Middle East at the expense of the Palestinian people. And they put the Palestinian people back on the agenda. And they could have done it in a more brutal, disgusting, terrorist kind of fashion. So those of us who consider ourselves Zionists, who are fully supportive of Palestinian self-determination, of Palestinian rights, of, of Palestinian statehood, I go as far as promoting a Palestinian confederacy with Israel, two states, one country have felt incredibly pushed out and marginalized on the left by this craziness in which there is no acknowledgement, there was denial of, by women's justice groups in America that women were raped. They were saying that women, women's groups in America were saying that women who claimed to be raped were lying. 
An organization called Midwest Access Coalition, which fights for women's reproductive rights in Illinois, took out a statement, made a statement in November that said, that called on an immediate ceasefire by Israel, not by both sides, not called for release for hostages, because Palestinian women in Gaza, they said, were being prevented from going to get their abortions in Gaza. Do you know the last time there was an abortion in Gaza? <laughs> a woman who wants an abortion in Gaza gets murdered because it is against Hamas's far right-wing religious theological theocracy ideas. All these groups were making outlandish statements of support, and so those of us in the middle, we didn't have a place to breathe. You can't go hang out with the folks on the right. There was a big rally in November in support of Israel that all kinds of Jews went to. I personally want to touch it. If you were going to have a rally in Washington, D.C. in support of Israel, how many clergy people would you have speak at it? Probably none because you want it to be short. But let's say you were going to have a clergy person. How many clergy people would, would you have? Let's say you had one. What kind of clergy person would it be? you think it would be a rabbi. Sure. They had one clergy person speak at that rally, and that was Hagee, the founder of um, Christians for Israel, mm -hmm. the right-wing evangelical, myopic kind of view who wants Israel to exist because it hopes for the rapture. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, So you can't, if you're in the middle, you've got nowhere to go. And that's still where we are today. Campuses are starting to... Let me just say one more thing. We had um, Shahira Shalabi, uh, who is the former deputy mayor of Haifa, a uh, Palestinian Israeli, speak at Haqqafah back in March. And she said, and I quote, the one thing you need to know about Israel-Palestine is that the only people who... I think I said this to you in March. The only people who don't know what they're talking about in Israel-Palestine are the ones who think they do. <laughs> Great comment. So I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> right? I do. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so both the left and the right, I want to hug them and I want to wring their necks. When I see on the streets protests in, at Columbia University and Passover, and they're having a Passover Seder, as part of their protest against Israel, and they're talking about we're being freed from Egypt to go to Europe. I think that's crazy. But I also respect the fact that they feel like they're doing something deeply Jewish and making connections with other peoples in ways that I, in this world over there, couldn't imagine doing. Which group is it? Uh, there was a, it was the protesters at Columbia University that were um, in the encampments at Columbia University had this huge say to that Palestinians and Black Lives Matter folk. It, it was beautiful. There was a great picture of it on social media from a drone. Uh, of, they had painted a Seder plate on the ground. Wow. It was gorgeous. Good for them, and I want to wring their necks. <laughs> Over here, I, I the right... As a Zionist, I get it. I want to embrace our people and I want to wring our necks because all we're doing is running scared and we're running away from our responsibility to hold all of this in the discomfort of what it is and to be able to do so together. So here we are a year later and the left is still being the left and the right still being the right and those of us in the middle are just trying to hold on and coming to places like you to kind of tell you all this. Why? Because we hope, if nothing else, that if you think you know what you're talking about over there, you take a step back and realize none of us does. And that is complex. And until there is something that happens, I hold Bibi Netanyahu responsible. I hold Sinwar responsible. Until something changes on the ground over there, it's going to continue to be like this here, especially if it escalates over there. 
So I ask you only to understand the complexity. If you can't understand it, to feel the complexity and to never be sure of what you're talking about over there. Thank you. Uh, still a few minutes and probably more than a few minutes of questions, but anybody? I think 943. It's 943. Good I think uh, one of the problems in this entire situation is that going back to uh, the establishment of Israel back in the 1940s is because nobody in the world wanted to have the Jews in their country. Uh, was that you know, America has supported financially Israel over all these years and the armaments, from what I understand, that are being used against Hezbollah and Lebanon and against um, people in Gaza are, have been paid for by the American by the American government. And I know over the years, because America was giving a lot of money to many different countries, like $32 million. And then, you know, as inflation escalated over the years, we have been we were giving them more than half of it. Yeah. Um, and also, I really think that another part of the problem is that from the inception back in 1945, 48, uh, 1945 is that the Palestinians were divided into two parts rather than being one section of the country. And this might have come from Nazis 48. Nazis 48. Yeah, but this might have come from the Jewish people too, because they knew that there was one country and them that the uh, Palestinians would be stronger. Dividing them up, they're weaker. It's just like it was India and Bangladesh and what's the other country? Well, Texas. <laughs> um, you know, that um, they were divided up too. Uh, and they were continuous divisions. But I think this problem of our supporting, our government supporting Israel financially is. So let me say three things since it's 945. Number one, Israel didn't separate the people. The partition plan that was put together by the UN purposely partitioned people to whether Palestinian populations and Jewish populations, which was a hodgepodge, which the Jews accepted in 48 and the Palestinians didn't. So it wasn't the Jews who did that. The plan for Palestine and for the West Bank and Gaza, I agree with you. That was one of my slides that we didn't get to. That's been part of the strategy since 67. But it was not the Jewish idea partition and divide. And number two, the United States did not fund Israel until much later. The initial funder of Israel was Russia. Russia gave actually provided, if it wasn't for Russia, United, Israel never would have uh, won the war of independence. So I just want to make that clear. And number three, let me say that, yeah, the military industrial complex is huge. Israel gets $3.4 billion worth of support, supporting Arab countries around it gets the equivalent, if not a little bit more. 80% of, of American dollars that go to Israel's armaments gets spent in the United States. No politician is going to shut down a factory that makes munitions in, in, in order to make a statement about Israel-Palestine. You are 100% right, we should fight the military industrial complex, but that money doesn't go to Israel freely. That's about American, uh, the American economy which is a very different issue that plays into that. I can go on with that. I welcome more questions. And I, I, I'm not disagreeing with you about that support, but I know you all have to go, and i got to go to Springfield. Please, Thank you. please go to Springfield, and uh, you'll, you'll be speaking for all of us, I can tell you that. And I'm, just please go more. I'm, just please go. I'm just having dinner. Come back. <laughs> come back. Invite me again. We continue the conversation. I hope this is helpful. I'll be back.